So what if we actually started to live and believe that God has created us to live a certain type of life. God actually created us to live a certain type of life. Let me ask you this. What if too many of us are selling ourselves short? Maybe we're living on the fence, if you can even call it living. And many of us are simply existing. What if we decided today, this hour, this moment, that we would stop settling and start living? If we actually embraced what it means to live fully this life that God has for us, right? That we've been created for. What if as a church, we decided that the people who started meeting here 36 years, or started at a church 36 years ago, that we would look back on their sacrifice, their commitment, their focus, and we decided today, why not us? Why can't we have that same kind of passion? Why can't we have the same kind of drive where we trust God to lead us into and through the unknown? I guarantee you, Miss Becky, there were probably nights where you just didn't know what was ahead. <laughs> the unknown. Why can't we become the church that God has created us to be? A force for Christ that is playing a part of the restoration of life in people's lives and in our community. This is who we've been created to be. And we've been on a journey for the last six weeks with the people of Israel. A people God had rescued out of slavery. But he didn't just rescue them for the sake of rescuing them, right? He rescued them because, number one, he made a promise to their ancestors that he was going to create a people out of them. That not only was he rescuing them, but he was on a rescue mission for a much greater impact than just them. They were becoming representatives of his presence to all of creation, to every nation, throughout time. Right? This was what they were created to be. There is something different about the God of these people. There is supposed to be something different about the way they go about their lives. They're supposed to see the world differently. And at first, they wrestled with this idea. Remember that? They couldn't see it. They had a hard time with it. They liked the idea of being the people of God. But they weren't so big on the process of becoming the people of God. And so a whole generation has to pass away before they can actually set foot in the land God wanted to restore them to. I like to call them the desert generation. <laughs> and the desert generation has been through so much. God had met their needs all along the way. But for some reason, just a little part of them could never let go of Egypt. A little part of them could never let go of their past. And all the love God had poured out on them wasn't enough to convince them to trust him even in the face of their greatest fear. All the love that God had poured out on them. So God, we talked about this last week, God lets them have the desires of their hearts. They wanted to go back to Egypt. God said, start out toward Egypt. They would rather die in the desert, in the wilderness, than go into the land and die because of their greatest fears, the enemies that they saw. God said, all right. You'll die in the desert. You'll die in the wilderness. Now, to get to where we are going to end this story, I want to give you a little background. We talked a few weeks ago about when Moses had this, this engagement with God, this encounter with God on the, on the top of the mountain, Mount Sinai, right? 
God gave him the Ten Commandments, and then God also gave him all these different instructions for, and, and, and the idea, and we talked about this, how it was, bringing, it was bringing order out of a chaotic situation. It was bringing order out of a chaotic people. It was bringing order to the chaos. And so one of the things that God also instructs them is to build what's called the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, anybody seen uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, right? Yeah. Anybody remember Indiana Jones? He's old, old stuff, right? So God instructs them to build this, this, this encasing that would represent and also what would house what they perceived as the presence of God so that everywhere they went, they could see, visibly see that the presence of God was with them and they did not have to be afraid as long as they had the Ark of the Covenant. And there were some other rules. You couldn't get too close to it either. It was a pretty sacred piece. So now we finally come to the place. The old generation has passed away. The desert generation, who was stubborn and refused to trust God, they finally pass away. And with them, Moses finally passes away as well. An interesting situation that happens with Moses. Moses has a moment of disobedience and so he's not allowed to step into the new land either. But God does allow him to actually see the new land, but not step into it. Interesting backdrop. But here's the new generation. The new generation is about to step into the, the promised land, right? They're about to set into it, and they're up against the Jordan River. And so we're moving to the book of Joshua. If you have your Bibles or you can follow along on the screen. The book of Joshua, chapter 3. We're going to read this whole chapter because here is the excitement has been building. The new generation is ready to step across the Jordan and into the new land. But they still have some things that have to happen. Let's start up. Early the next morning, Joshua, who's now the new leader, right, after Moses, and all the Israelites left Acacia Grove and arrived at the banks of the Jordan River where they camped before crossing. Three days later, the Israelite officers went through the camp giving these instructions to the people. When you see the Levitical priest carrying the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God. I think we have the scripture, maybe not. We don't. All right. Well, you'll have to read it in your Bibles or listen to me. All right. When you see the Levitical priest carrying the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, move out from your positions and follow them. Since you have never traveled this way before, they will guide you. Stay about half a mile behind them, keeping a clear distance between you and the ark. Make sure you don't come any closer. Then Joshua told the people, purify yourselves. For the, tomorrow the Lord will, go, will do great wonders among you. In the morning, Joshua said to the priest, lift up the ark, right? We were talking about that. Lift up the ark of the covenant and lead the people across the river. And so they started out and went ahead of the people. The Lord told Joshua, today I will begin to make you a great leader in the eyes of all the Israelites. They will know that I am with you just as I was with Moses. Give the command to the priest who carry the ark of the covenant. When you reach the banks of the Jordan River, take a few steps into the river and stop there. So Joshua told the Israelites, come and listen to what the Lord your God says. Today you will know that the living God is among you. He will surely drive out the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Parasites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, and the Jebusites. Woo! Ahead of you. Look, the Ark of the Covenant, which belongs to the Lord of the whole earth, will lead you across the Jordan River. Now, choose 12 men from the tribes of Israel, one from each tribe. The priest will carry the ark of the, of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth. As soon as their feet touch the water, the flow of water will be cut off upstream and the river will stand up like a wall. So the people left their camp to cross the Jordan and the priests who were carrying the ark of the covenant went ahead of them. It was the harvest season, and the Jordan was overflowing to the river's edge, as if it just had to get worse, right? <laughs> the water above that point began backing up a great distance away at a town called Adam, which is near Zerithim. And the water below that point flowed on to the Dead Sea until the riverbed was dry. 
Then all the people crossed over near the town of Jericho. Meanwhile, the priests who were carrying the Ark of the Lord's covenant stood on dry ground in the middle of the riverbed as the people passed by. They waited there until the whole nation of Israel had crossed the Jordan on dry ground. So here's the scene. The people finally reached the river. They had a water problem. Does anybody else remember what other story involved water? <laughs> Do you remember the other point in their journey when they were up against a whole sea of water? And the enemy was coming at them, the Pharaoh and his army. It looked like Egypt was going to swallow them up again. But what does God do? He splits the sea. They walk through. So, God reminds them of his faithfulness. After all these years, again, he opens the waters so that they can walk through. And everything their parents and everything their grandparents have been through, God was still at work. God had not given up. It was not all for nothing. Now, in the next chapter, God gives them some instruction. Once they cross the Jordan and cross the dry ground, God tells them that he wants them to take 12 stones and build a memorial type, type of, of uh, a memorial that they would build right there in the middle of the river before the water came down. He wanted them to stack the 12 stones right there and to remember this point, what God had done. Take 12 stones and build a memorial. I was thinking about memorials. I was thinking about Legacy Weekend. You know what came to my mind? Memorial Stadium. <laughs> Memorial Stadium's doing real good right now. Two weeks in a row, right? <laughs> my son was in the first grade a couple of years ago, and for his field trip, we got to go to Memorial Stadium. We got to walk into that that lobby area where, where all the placards are and the history and it talked about all the great wins they had and all the great players and, and some pretty good coaches too. We walked through the, the exercise area, you know, it had it on the side there, the exercise room, and then we got to the tunnel, the tunnel where they reach up and touch something up here. The horseshoe, right, right, yeah, yeah. I was relatively new to the Nebraska scene at that time. But even I could tell how powerful an experience it was. Even I could take for just a moment and stand there and close my eyes and think about all the players that had walked through that tunnel. To think about all the coaches who had come through there. To think about the excitement and, and when they might have been standing there waiting for their time when they charge out onto the field and, and the pulse of the building, the people and the excitement and the crowds cheering. You could just sense a reverence there. Maybe even times when they walked back through after a defeat, a hard fought game. A memorial to remember. You know, I have a lot of respect for the culture. I have a lot of respect for what it means to Nebraskans. Because it's a, it's a memorial to more than just football. It really is. It's a reminder to this whole state of who we are, right? Of hard work and sacrifice of giving it your all. That's what it represents to us. It's part of our DNA as a state. So God wants the people of Israel to build a memorial to remember this moment. And God does not want them to forget their past. Don't forget where you came from. Don't forget who you came from. Don't forget what it took to get you to where you are. Because where you're going has been made possible only by the help 
of God. But I also think this is important. He doesn't want them to get stuck in their past. Right? This isn't where the story ends. This isn't the last we hear of the Israelites, right? They don't just get to the other side of the Jordan and then hang it all up and give up and say, well, this is what God did, so I guess he can't do anything else. (laughs) This was just the beginning. And they can't allow the memorial to become a chain around their necks. You see, getting stuck in the past is what kept the desert generation stuck in the desert. Did you know that? Getting stuck in the past is what kept the desert generation stuck in the desert. This memorial that God has Joshua make isn't so that they'll come back to it and say, look at the thing God did, so he's probably never going to do it again. Or this is the only way God does stuff, so he'll probably never do it again. No, the memorial wasn't meant to put God in a box or to chain them to the past. It's to be a catalyst for the future. That's what the memorial is supposed to be. A catalyst for the future. Legacy Weekend is a catalyst for the future. (laughs) It's to remind us that in the moments when it seems like whatever is ahead of us is too big, God is bigger. When you have an ocean in front of you, guess what? Not only can he divide the waters, but you just might walk on the water. Just ask Peter. Memorials in our faith should be catalysts for our future, not what chains us to the past. If we get chained to the past, we might want to make sure we're not worshiping our past. If we're chained to the past, it's probably why our future keeps looking the same every time we look up. (laughs) On this Legacy Weekend 2018, I want to tell you about some exciting things that are also in our future. The first thing I want to tell you about is our partnership with the Hope Center for Kids. I think we have a video. Let's take a look. I want to tell you about the Hope Center. Here it is. The Hope Center for Kids. The Hope Center for Kids. Strives to faithfully inspire hope. Strives to faithfully inspire hope. In the lives of youth and children. In the lives of youth and children. Through education. Through education. Employability. Employability. Collaboration. Collaboration. And faith. And faith. When kids come to the Hope Center for Kids, they experience hope. It's a safe space for young people to come and get enrichment, upliftment spiritually. They're getting academic support. When kids come to the Hope Center for Kids, it is a tangible expression of hope in their community. They learn the skills they need to get and keep a good job. Kids are able to come to the Hope Center to receive meals where it may not otherwise be accessible to them. They're looking for a positive environment where they can flourish and grow. When kids come through the Hope Center for Kids, they get to experience truly what the love of Christ is all about. They are there to thrive and fill up their hearts with joy and love and happiness and hope and take it into their home lives, their schools, and into the streets of Omaha. And a safe place to have families to know they can send their children to. They can expect access to supportive staff who are committed to not only them, but their families and their success. They're really entering into an environment that sets them up for success. They can feel like they have a safe place to learn, a safe place to grow, and a safe place to be who they are. If the Hope Center for Kids didn't exist, I hate to think of that thought. But I think it would leave a real gap in uh, what's available to kids in North Omaha. I can't imagine an Omaha without the Hope Center. If the Hope Center for Kids didn't exist, many kids in the North Omaha area would not have a safe and supportive place to go during the day. If the Hope Center didn't exist, not only would all of these kids not have an opportunity to experience the tangible love of God, but they also might not be getting the skills that they need to really help them break out of the cycle of poverty. I I believe there'd be a hole in the community's heart. Less graduation parties. If the Hope Center for Kids didn't exist, 
Kids in parts of our state with some of the greatest need would go without their support. A high level of crime, a lack of community engagement. If the Hope Center for Kids didn't exist, I don't know where our kids would experience the Christ-like love that they experience when they come through our doors. I've seen hope be the tangible reality of when you step out in faith and you dream God-sized dreams. The neighborhood that I remember growing up, it's starting to look and feel that way again, and certainly the Hope Center is a big part of that. I've seen hope change those we serve, and I've seen hope change me. But I've seen hope in the organizations that the Hope Center collaborates with, the school districts, the families, the communities, the other organizations that they deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. I've seen hope um, since the first day we opened the doors and kids walked through those doors, like Alicia, Jenna, and Tricretia, and Dominic, Chris and I, Derek, Anthony, and I could go on and on, and Puka, and Bate, and Tyrell, and Dave. Those are the kids that became Hope family, and we're family forever. And what I see in those kids is a reflection of hope, which is smiles and laughter and enthusiasm. On graduation day, when the kids walk across the stage and pick up their diploma. I see hope as being a beacon and a lighthouse of um, change in the midst of a world that is so torn by hurts and wounds and things like that. I see hope as being a prophetic symbol of the kingdom of God in our city. I see it in the, in the lives of young people uh, that I've had an opportunity to work with personally. I look at so many of our, our young kids that have come through and experienced that hope, but also the adults too that have come through and experienced truly what it is to have hope in the Lord. We see hope actually being birthed in their lives, actually taking hold of their lives and is shaping them for the future. I believe in hope. 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 So, two years ago, in the fall, Pastor Joe and I, our, our youth pastor, noticed that on Wednesday evening, we had a large amount of teenagers who would walk across that road right there on military. And they would hang out here on Wednesday afternoons from about 3 o'clock until 8 or 8.30. So many of these kids. And so Joe and I started talking, what would it look like if we could, could do an after-school program every single day, a place for kids to come to and hang out and get their work done and build relationships and, and build relationships with the church? I wonder what that could look like. Do you, do you know what that might look like? Where could we find out who's doing that already? Oh, the Hope Center. The Hope Center. With a central focus on Jesus, helping kids in all areas of their lives. So I got to praying and got thinking. And I remember uh, looking out here on this piece of land. See, we own, if you look back behind us, we own uh, up to where the tree line is right back here, all the way out to where the tree line ends. And I thought, what would it look like if the Hope Center in Fremont was right here. And then I got to be a part of their advisory council and I found out that the location where they are now is maxed out at times. It's maxed out in their transportation. They're having a hard time getting kids from the school to their location. From the school to their location. What's our location? Where's the school? Right there. So, I remember thinking, whoa, 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 God. <laughs> this is a big project. I remember thinking, there's no way that we could do this. We owe debt on a building, right? Nobody needs, we don't need any more debt. <laughs> so God, if, if this is going to happen, number one, 
the Hope Center's got to see the vision, and our community has got to see the vision and rally to it. So I shared it with our leadership team, our board, at first. And I think they probably thought, uh-huh, go ahead, Aaron, try that. <laughs> we all kind of thought, this is way too big. But we started talking to the Hope Center. I even thought, surely they'll shut that down when I start talking to the Hope Center. They're not going to want to do something like this. And I said, well, let's think about this. So then they started meeting, and they actually came back and said, let's keep exploring and having the conversation, see where it takes us. I said, okay, let's do that. So then they met with their board and their leadership, and this past year, they decided, let's take it to a whole nother level. Would you be willing to partner with us, us as a church partner with them, to have an actual architect who comes in and leads us through a process, right, to make sure that our two organizations could work together that would outline all the different parts that go to it and then also show us what we would need to financially make it happen. Again, all along the way, I want to tell you something I have said, and I am committed to, the community will have to help us financially build it. What we bring to the table is the land and the location. The community will have to help us. The, the CEO, the, the chairman of their organization, Brenda Block, called me before we were, while we were trying to set up meeting times. She said, you will not believe this, Aaron. She said, I've already got two people in the Omaha area who want to help fund the building. I said, are you kidding me? She's like, that doesn't normally happen like that. I was like, okay, so let's keep moving. And so we actually decided on Todd Brown. I don't know if you know who Todd Brown is. Todd Brown was part of helping to build this facility and help us make that possible and lead us through that whole process. And so now the next level that we've decided to take is to sit down, both the Hope Center and us, with Todd Brown to build a master plan and to show us what it looks like for us. Now, there's some great things that are also in this for our church. It'll be a place for our teenagers to use and to have like their worship night on Wednesday nights. Our teenagers could have access to it. The different parts of it that would have happened, like different kind of adult classrooms and maybe some space where we could have funeral dinners, larger dinners and groups like that. That's what I see that happening. And it also being a community center for other organizations in our community to come and be a part of. Can you imagine? And so I was at their last dinner a couple of weeks ago and the Hope Center, I was in this big, it was in this big, um, it was down at CenturyLink, five or six hundred people, you know, all kinds of people there from all over Omaha. And then up on the screen it said, potential partnership with Fremont Nazarene Church. That's us. Yeah. Yeah? That's us. But we're just starting the process. And I want to recognize some folks. First of all, if you are a part of the board or on the leadership team, would you stand? I'd like for the leadership team, all the board members, please stand. I want you to see who they are. All right? If you have any questions, and if you are, if you are also on the task force for the, uh, the Hope Center Task Force, if you would stand too. Hope Center Task Force people. Stay standing, board members. Hope Center Task Force. Julie's over there, and other board members are part of that. So if you have questions along the way, these are the folks you want to talk to. You guys can be seated. If you want to have input in that, these are the folks you talk to. We're just starting, but I'm going to make the commitment to you that I've made all along the way. Number one, the community will have to help us build it. I realize and I recognize we cannot take on any more debt. Well, guess what? This kind of feels like a Jordan River moment, doesn't it? And guess what God did? Guess what God can do? Amen? So today, the reason we recognize the Shaw family this weekend isn't that we'd get changed to the past. Because I guarantee you, Pastor Tom would not want us to be changed to the past, right? 
We recognize them because we remember what God is capable of when people trust him and love him so much that they're willing to lay it all on the line. Right? Uh, you, that was weak. I'm going to say it one more time. We recognize them because we remember what God is capable of when people trust him and love him so much that they're willing to lay it all on the line. Yeah. Amen? <laughs> when Pastor Tom and Becky heard his calling to them to start a church in Fremont, Nebraska, they said yes. And every single one of us here today, we're here because they said yes. We have a Hispanic gathering because they said yes. We have a thriving youth and children's ministry because they said yes. We have Celebrate Recovery that meets here because they said yes. We have the potential for a Hope Community Center because they said yes. We have a thriving preschool academy because they said yes. Right? So if they said yes, what are we going to say? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so that's what's ahead of us. We trust God. We have a legacy. Not to get chained to the past, but to be a catalyst for our future. To believe that not only will God part the waters, but he might also call us to step out onto the water. Let's stand together. I'm going to ask Tori and Jeanette if they would come. Tori leads worship in our Hispanic community gathering. They're going to sing a song called Oceans. Spirit, lead me. Where my faith, my faith will hold. Let's trust God. I've said over and over again, if God shuts the door, we're okay with that. But if he opens the door, let's trust him and step into it. Yeah. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes for a moment? In a setting like this, I don't, want to, I don't want to miss the chance to also say that maybe today you haven't started a relationship with God. This whole faith thing is, is something that is, is way beyond what you think you're supposed to have, and, but you're drawn here. Maybe you're drawn here today because you knew the Shaw family was going to be here and you wanted to say hi to them, and so you step back into church. God is calling you to say yes to him, first of all, to give your heart to him, to step into the life that he has created you to live. So will you say yes to him first? God has called us as a church to be the church. To live out the love of God. To be a representation of his presence right here in this community. So let's say yes to him today. Father, thank you for the sense of your Holy Spirit speaking and moving in this place. Thank you for the reminders of what you have done so that we can know what you are capable of doing. May we say yes to you in every area of our lives. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen.